I invite you to open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12 in the New Testament. And we will be reading verses 1 and 2. Hebrews 12, verses 1 and 2. Again, keeping in mind, as we studied not long ago, as Ken led us through that study in the adult class, that this is written to Jewish Christians who were in the process of leaving the gospel system. So what is in this book is designed to strengthen a child of God, to warn a child of God, to build up a child of God, to cause that child of God to be circumspect and cautious, to be honest in the examination of his or her own life in the light of the truth. Now you'll notice that the first verse of chapter 12 begins with wherefore. Wherefore is again one of those words such as hence or therefore or so that means I've been reasoning with you all through the matters preceding this and here's the conclusion. And of course the 11th chapter is that great chapter on the faithful worthies of the Old Testament who never knew the New Testament system. They never knew the church, the plan of salvation. But under the laws God gave them, whether the patriarchy or the law of Moses, they were faithful to the truth that was at their disposal. And this is one reason they're used, because these people knew well who had been written about in chapter 11. And they had noted all these men and recognized them to be what they were. But always, as he's done all the way up through chapter 11, he's pointing out none of that was permanent. All of what we've been covering has been the unfolding of the scheme of redemption down through the stream of time. And you, the people that are the recipients of this letter, are the ones who have enjoyed the full revelation of God's will and the perfect law of liberty, James 127, 125. And yet you're giving it up due to persecution. So when he says wherefore, he's got that in mind as specifically these faithful worthies such as begin listed in verse 4 of Hebrews 11. So he says, you can see this, wherefore seeing we also Accomplished about with so great a cloud of witnesses. These people he's mentioned have been witnesses. They, they've gone on. They've left their earthly scene. They were faithful to God's will for them at the time. And they're pictured as setting up in the stadium now watching these who have so much more than they did to be able to live for God on this earth and watching them as it were. Not that they're literally doing so. But they live for what was going to come that the people who received this letter have. They never received any of it. So wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, what should we do? In other words, in view of Abel, in view of Enoch, in view of Noah, in view of Abraham, etc. And their dedication to God and the examples you know they are in faithful service to God. What should you do now that you have this and you have had it? Why are you giving it up? Let us lay aside every weight that doth so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. That also carries with it an idea of the latter part of that verse. You think you've been suffering? Didn't you know it was the suffering and death of Christ that made you what you are? And these folks all look forward to that day coming. You've been privileged to enjoy it. So wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about, or compassed about, with so great a cloud of witnesses. Now, 
The point I'm wanting to emphasize is what he calls the besetting sin. We don't use that word besetting, but it means that which continually occurs, which seems to be easy to occur, that people just continue to get involved in it. What is that besetting sin? It's simply unbelief. Unbelief. Not believing, in this case, in Jesus as the Messiah, as the one who provides the only way of salvation. <clears throat> John 14, 6, where he declared, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes with the Father but by me. Nothing's really changed as far as the truth of the Bible regarding belief and unbelief. Faith is the noun form of the verb believe. And faith in Christ is formed by the truth of the gospel. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So therefore, the faith that saves today has to be not the faith of Abraham in the sense of the law he lived under. It was patriarchy. Or Moses and the law he delivered to the Jews, lasting some 1,500 years, and from which these people had left, or from it they had departed and obeyed the gospel. So they are in unbelief after having known the truth and had belief formed in them in Christ, and they're giving it up. But throughout history, man has been engaged in this kind of wickedness, and that's what unbelief is. When you look round about you, you have a lot of folks who say, I do not believe in God. I do not believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. I do not believe in the Bible as the Word of God. You'll have others who will come along and say, well, I believe in God and I believe in Christ and I believe the words of the Bible and belief is all that's necessary. And by that they mean accepting the fact that Christ is the Son of God. That's all that God requires of us is to accept the fact that He is. And James deals with dead faith and says it won't avail anything. Faith apart from works is dead, being alone, James 2. Well, then what kind of faith saves? Hebrews 5, earlier stated, several chapters over earlier, that it's the faith that obeys. That's the only kind of faith that ever has saved anybody. And faith never has saved anybody except that it obeyed and it didn't say before it obeyed. So he's the author of eternal salvation and do all them that obey him. These are ceasing to obey the things Christians must stay true to and thus they're in a system of unbelief. You will also notice that when you go through the Old Testament and it talks about Israel, and we may see some of that in a moment, being in unbelief, that's another way of saying they wouldn't do what God told them and the way God told them and for the reason God told them. That's unbelief. People don't want to accept it as such. Would it make any difference what people don't want to accept or accept? Disobedience is a form of unbelief. So really when you think about it from the sin of unbelief, all kinds of false views toward God and the religion of God have been developed. Every transgression and sin of omission, omitting what God obligates us to do, lies in the sin of unbelief. The reason we try to speak on it all the time and say, how do you measure your faith with God? Is it by saying, well, I don't do this sin, I don't do that sin? Of course we don't want to do those sins. Lie, cheat, steal, commit fornication, adultery, be covetous. No, you can't do those things to go to heaven. Galatians 5 makes it clear. Those are the works of the flesh. Anybody that does them cannot enter heaven. But I'm telling you the thing that irritates our relationship, proper relationship to God is the fact that of all these things God's enjoined upon us that we leave undone. So this sin strangles obedience. It bars progress. It promotes cowardice. It closes the door to opportunity. It opens the floodgates of iniquity. 
It pours water on the, on the on enthusiasm for serving God. And eventually, as it was doing here with these Jewish Christians, it will completely overthrow their faith and there will be no triumph with God. The church needs to be concerned about that. Most of the New Testament is written to Christians to keep them from falling. We who are alive today as Christians must be concerned about our brothers and sisters in Christ. If they're strong, we want to keep them strong. If I'm strong, I want to keep myself strong. You know, I think sometimes we think, well, the fellow that's a strong servant of God, he's a faithful child of God. Why, well, he's he just that way. It's no big effort on his part. Well, that just doesn't work that way. Surely just a cursory reading of anywhere in the Bible concerning those that love God keep his commandments shows the struggle to be obedient to bring every thought as Paul said into subjection to Jesus Christ to set our affections on things above and not on things on the earth I want us to look at what are very terrible consequences of unbelief and we'll just list some of these these will be not new to you but uh, hopefully they will just register as Peter wanted his message to register on people who had already knew these things. Unbelief led to the world before the flood to give no heed to the preaching of Jonah that Peter talks about. And because they chose to put their mind only on evil continually, God brought that great flood into the world to destroy them. Romans 1 tells about how the Gentiles just desired not to retain God of their knowledge. So God gave them up to do all the wicked things that men continue to do. Unbelief laid the foundations of the vanity of the Tower of Babel. Uh, when you think of all the things such as Lot's wife and her being warned as well as Lot and the rest not to look back. But she looked back at the destructions of Sodom and she suffered the consequences, turning to a pillar of salt, Genesis 11, 18, and 19. But it, it goes on. And you ask, well, why is all that in the Old Testament? Why are you coming across that? Why, what do I get out of that? Why has God made this so repetitive throughout the Old Testament? Well, unbelief brought God's wrath on Israel. Now, what's that saying? Well, Israel, God's own people that he formed out of all, the, all that was there on the earth and made them a special people. That mean they didn't have to do what God told them? Not at all. Listen to what we have. Because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. Now just simply think, think of the actions of the Israelites down through the years. God informed Moses that unbelief on his part even prevented him from entering the land of promise. He, God gave the Israelites water two times out of a rock. First time, Moses was commanded to strike the rock. Second time, he was commanded of God to speak to the rock. And he was so angry that he struck the rock. And thus, he didn't do what God told him to do. Well, my, why be so picky? Where do we ever learn that we have a right to set aside anything concerning the obligations God laid upon us? He says, because ye believe me not. Now, here's a point I want to make. Do you mean Moses became an atheist? He says he believed him not. Or do we see a usage of believe me not that means you didn't do what he told you the way he told you for the reason he told you? That's what it means. That's what believe me not means. So when people want to say that believe always means just accepting the fact of God's existence and the deity of Christ and the Bible is the word of God and that's all that's necessary for salvation, well, I tell you, Moses believed in God. Moses had proven all his life that he would do what God told him to do, but he failed here. Human weakness, he failed, and because of that he wasn't allowed by God to enter in to the land of Canaan, Numbers 20, 7 through 12. Why is that in your Bible? What do you get out of it when you read it? How do you apply it to your own life? And what do you use from that to teach others? The same sin, unbelief, 
caused Israel of old to reject the true report of the spies when they had been sent into the land of Canaan. And because of that, Israel was made to wander 40 years of wilderness to everybody 20 years old and upward to die, except Caleb and Joshua. And once they entered the land, it was unbelief that led Achan to take the spoils of the city of Jericho that they first destroyed. And to this list could be added many, many other different chapters recording unbelief, disobedience. Now, after recounting many of these events, we turn to the New Testament, find the great apostle Paul, who certainly as a Jew was familiar with these, very familiar. And he writes about these things. And he says to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 11, Now all these things happened unto them for in samples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Thus, these things were being recorded by a loving father as he developed the scheme of redemption down through time for all of us. So we could look back and see, well, God meant what he said back then. And he said what he meant. And he expected people to obey him. What about now? These have such a bearing on our salvation that the apostle wrote for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. What scriptures? All these Old Testament scriptures. People say, you folks don't believe in the Old Testament. Well, we believe in the authority of Christ because he has all authority in heaven and on earth and that's manifest in the New Testament. But does that mean there's nothing to learn from the Old Testament? Well, of course not. Anybody that says Otherwise, just doesn't know what he or she's talking about. If I'm to really benefit from the Old Testament, then the more I know my New Testament, the more I see it anchored in the Old Testament. As the old preachers used to say, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. But Romans 15.4 was written in a New Testament book to Christians in Rome, and so it echoes down through these last 2,000 years to each of us today as members of the church. Saying, you better spend some time in the Old Testament and realize what those lessons are saying. And they're saying God means what he says and says what he means. And he doesn't allow for people to just simply thumb their noses at the truth. Especially Israel suffered because of unbelief. Guess what? Spiritual Israel can also be found wanting. And thus the writer of Hebrews says this in Hebrews 3.12. Take heed, brethren. Well, take heed. There's a rattlesnake loose out there somewhere under these pews. Be careful. Take heed. Watch out. What would you do if you knew what I just told you is the truth? You'd at least be holding your feet up, I think. That'd be a lot more than that. So take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. The evil heart of unbelief. What kind is it? Look back at the Old Testament. Did they have an evil heart of unbelief? Well, how did they manifest that unbelief? It didn't mean they denied the existence of God. Or they said, oh, Lord, Moses is nothing. It just meant they didn't do what God said. God's word was also presented unto them. And here's what he said in the right of Hebrews, or the right of Hebrews wrote. But the word preached did not profit them. Why? Well, they understood the words, not being mixed with faith. They just had no confidence in God based upon his word. They kept saying, we can do what we want to. God's going to save us. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it, Hebrews 4.2. Do you think that still exists today? Look around at the denominational world in particular. Over and over again, just believe in Christ. That's all that's necessary. They have a view of grace that says, well, he's going he's to take care of you. 
You don't have to be that particular. You can't save yourself. Just go ahead and do a little bit of everything. And as long as you're mindful of God and think about him now and then, that's all right. Well, do you think that the idea of salvation by grace alone originated in the last 500 years? Or was it practiced very well <laughs> by the Israelites themselves? So we cannot lightly brush aside these dangerous signs. It's like flashcards they used to be. That's what's being put up here. Take note, take note. This applies to you. Let us fear is what the writer of Hebrews said. Lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Hebrews 4.12. Now what's interesting is that God expected the people who received this letter to be able to make the comparison and judge themselves as to whether they were faithful to God or not on the basis of what that faithfulness meant under the Old Testament. Faithfulness under the Old Testament to the law God gave those people was do what God told you the way God told you for the reason God told you. If there's more than one reason, fine, more than one reason. Well, what's the difference under the perfect law of liberty, the law of Christ, James 1.25? There's not any, or there can't be any application made from the Old Testament if it has no bearing on our attitude toward the New Testament and toward the teachings of Christ. It's recorded of Jesus, and this is very interesting. We could preach a whole sermon on this. It uh, is recorded that he came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as did receive him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. John 1, 11 and 12. In the Greek, it literally means he came unto his own people. Now, it says that elsewhere in just those words, but it doesn't come right out here. And his, his own people in his own land, his own people in his own land would receive him. Notice an important point here about belief. When you're brought to a state of accepting the evidence that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the only begotten Son of God and the only Savior of the world, that He truly is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by Him, now you have the power to become the sons of God. This passage is not saying the moment you believe in Christ as the Bible presents Him, you're saved. It does not say that. I can only give you the language of Holy Writ. Those who believe, what about them? To them gave he power to become. To become. Let that sink in. Believers have a right to become. Can't get plainer than that. Now, if you haven't believed, you don't even have the groundwork to become a child of God. But if you have been brought to belief in Christ as the Son of God, you're now to where you can become a child of God and everything else in the whole New Testament concerning the plan of salvation says belief precedes the rest of the plan of repenting, confessing faith and completing your obedience to the gospel and being baptized in Christ for the remission of your sins but unbelief was to keep many from entering God's church listen to what it said in Matthew 13 58 of Jesus and he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Where? In his own country where he grew up. Why? They didn't believe him. They didn't believe in him. And Mark adds this to it. That's from Matthew 13, 58. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Mark 6, 6. Imagine. There stands the Lord like a man, and he is a man. And because of the evidence he knew that he had offered in his life that he was the Son of God, the Messiah, and they didn't believe, you can just see him saying, have you ever said, I can't believe they don't understand that. That's what you get out of Christ there. I'm amazed. I'm marveling the fact that all this evidence is there, and they don't get it. How often have we done that kind of thing today? I think of the, and it is a refreshing thing, it must have been refreshing to Christ to hear him uh, or to read of him where he heard the father of the lad that could not speak uh, as he with tears said to Jesus, 
Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief, Mark 9, 34. If ever is anything incorporated to any of your prayers, that you would have your faith to be stronger, then there it is. Oh, Lord, help my unbelief. Help my faith to be stronger. So how often we today should confess this and plead with God for greater faith and then do what's necessary to have it. What crucified Jesus Christ? Well, it was unbelief. That was the besetting sin, and that's what we're talking about Come from Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. It's the underlying cause of the crucifixion of our Lord. In speaking of the fundamentals of our faith, Paul said to the Jewish leaders, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 8. Paul even confesses that as he persecuted the church, he did it in ignorance and unbelief. Peter said of them who are guilty, and now, brethren, I know that through ignorance you did it, as did your rulers. Acts 3.17, that's the second gospel sermon recorded by Luke. Well, at the time that Jesus was put to death, you remember, as I just alluded to a moment ago, that Saul of Tarsus had the attitude where he said even further, as to that which I referred to, that he said, I was a blasphemer. I spoke against God and godly things, the church and so on. I was injurious. I sought to hurt them. We see how he held the clothes of those that stoned Stephen. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. 1 Timothy 1.13 so when the evidence presented itself to Saul of Tarsus, he doesn't try to resist at all. He just simply says, what will you have me to do? There are a lot of folks who teach today, there's not a thing in the world you can do to be saved from your sins. Well, look at the Apostle Paul, who was a great persecutor of the church. When he was Saul of Tarsus, he was traveling to Damascus to arrest people who were Christians, bring them back to Jerusalem. And yet when Jesus appeared to him, and he appeared to him not to convert him, but to make him an apostle, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Who art thou, Lord? That very question says, everything I've been doing has been in ignorance and unbelief. And then he says, I am Jesus of Nazareth, who thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. That's another way of saying it. it's hard to go against the facts that are so obvious. And then he won't know what to do. Every person I've ever seen that's truly repented and desired to do God's will, when they recognized they had not, they had not obeyed God, they've always said, let's, let's get this done. And that was the attitude of Ananias when he saw Saul Tarsus being a believer and one who had repented, he said, well, what are you waiting on? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on his name. And some people say, well, he was saved on the road to Damascus when he believed in Jesus. Well, I won't deny he didn't believe in Jesus. But he wasn't saved. If he was, Jesus sent a man to a person that he knew was already saved on the road to tell him what to do to be saved. Now, that makes sense. So he tells them what to do in Acts 22, 16. We're familiar with that case of Saul of Tarsus. We just don't want to follow it for some reason. The world does things like that, and that's because of unbelief. The world today is plagued by unbelief. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God, John 3, 18. But we've already seen that belief is not just saying Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. He's the only Savior of the world. Or else what did Jesus mean when he says, Why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Obviously, the Old Testament lessons show that faith is always saved only when it obeyed. People wonder, well, why carry the gospel into the world? Because they don't believe. And they can't believe without the word of truth. Well, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And a saving faith is obedience to the truth. Jesus warned, for if you believe not that I am he, 
you shall die in your sins, John 8, 24. Yeah, but you said belief only wouldn't say. That's right. If you don't get them to believe, they're not going to repent, confess faith in Christ and be baptized. You've got to bring them to belief. Belief is essential. No one's ever said it wasn't. It's very important. It's the basis of everything else. That's why it's used in Jude 3, contend for the faith. It stands for the whole New Testament system. It's so significant. So one item is pulled out to stand for the whole thing. Contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. He's not talking about individual belief. He's talking about how faith stands for the whole New Testament system. And we're to contend for all of it or any part of it. Many have heard this. They, they won't believe. Or else they wouldn't believe and be saved. When you believe like the New Testament believed, you'll do what Saul of Tarsus did when he believed. You'll complete your obedience to the gospel by repenting of sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and you'll be baptized in order to obtain the remission of sins. Now, that's just beginning. To my brethren, you haven't got to heaven when you walk where I sat water grave of baptism. That's just putting you into a position to shape yourself the rest of your life to get ready for heaven. I wish we knew that because it's, it's because it's ridden you of all past sins. So being baptized into Christ scripturally, Romans 6, 3 and 4, Romans 6, 17 and 18, is very necessary, essential. But it's to get you ready so you can grow up in Christ, to develop. So people need to understand that the belief that saves is the belief that complies with God's will. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Believe that believeth not shall be damned, Mark 16, 16. Well, of course you're going to be damned if you don't believe, because if you don't believe, you're not going to do the rest. So why go around and say, He that believeth not and repenteth not and confesseth not and is baptized not shall be lost. doesn't make sense. It's like the train coming down the track and you want... What, knock the whole thing off the track. You have to knock each car off the track. If it's 100 cars, you have to knock each one of them off the track. Just get the front wheels of the engine and knock it off, and the whole thing's gone. Well, if you can stop a person from believing in Christ as Son of God, he's not going to repent, not scripturally. He's not going to confess faith in Christ the Son of God, and he's not going to be baptized. So he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be condemned. Unbelief then, I'll, we'll close on this, I speak to my brethren, unbelief shackles the church. We need to understand that God expects us to excel once we're baptized into Christ, rise and water your grave as new creatures, added to the church by the Lord, Acts 2, 47. We've been baptized into Christ, we're in our all spiritual blessings, located by the Lord, Ephesians 1, 3. And he expects us then to grow. As Peter said, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word, that you may grow thereby. Well, I've seen people in the church for years, and they're just dried up babies. I mean that kindly, but to use the same thing the Holy Spirit used to say how we ought to grow, they've never desired the sincere milk of the word like they should. And thus, if you knew them 20 years ago, they're still stumbling over the same thing, living the same way they are today because they never studied they never really were interested. They never did grasp the real meaning of seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Jesus promised give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over shall men give unto your bosom. Luke six thirty eight. That means you put everything you are into it. As far as this life's concerned, nothing else matters but to know and do the will of God. Well, wasn't that taught in the Old Testament? And we quote it most often. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? For this is the whole duty of man. So if we're to be in the church what we ought to be, it'll be because our belief leads us to do what the Lord said members of the church are to do. And we'll be totally involved in it. Now, James was written to members of the church. And James chapter 2 that deals with the dead faith was aimed at members of the church. Now, being aimed at members of the church doesn't remove other folks outside of Christ from the message. The message has always been that a living, active, obedient faith saves, regardless of which side of baptism it's on. Are you a Christian today? 
What about that sin that doth so easily beset us? We need to lay aside every weight and that sin along with it and run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. If you are subject to the invitation, we've studied throughout this sermon how to become a Christian. We've seen also that Christians live according to the teaching of the New Testament. That's what it means to be faithful. Be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. If you need to repent of sins and confess them, we offer this opportunity for you to do so, as well as to become a Christian. So why not come now while we stand and sing?